Okay, we are here in Shinjuku. I'm here with uh, Stephen Donald, legend of the 2011 Rugby World Cup. Apologies for the sounds, there is a very expensive car about to reverse uh, out of this hotel. It's an interesting area of town. You, you definitely picked the, the kind of the most energetic place in Tokyo to stay, Stephen. Yeah, not my choice, but uh, yeah, a bit of entertainment there on how to uh, get a car out of the car park. <laughs> uh, like, Ireland against the All Blacks tomorrow is this game that a lot of Irish people actually didn't see coming, believe it or not, or, uh, as early as this in the tournaments. It's probably not something that a lot of All Blacks probably expected either. They probably looked at Ireland as potential pool toppers. Is there any bit of consternation at all from a New Zealand perspective that this is a bit of a banana skin a little bit too early in the tournament? Oh, I think absolutely. It's probably changed the, the landscape. We probably, if every New Zealander was honest, they're probably thinking it was going to be a Scotland or Japan or maybe even a Samoa quarter final. So I don't think any of us thought that it was going to be Ireland. But uh, the way it's panned out, obviously, with um, Japan's great run of form, it, uh, it sort of started to take on a whole different look at a few weeks ago. Does what happened last year have any bearing whatsoever in terms of how the All Blacks prepare for this game? I wouldn't think for the All Blacks, but I think for Ireland, obviously, you know, it's probably important that they have had a win against the All Blacks. You know, obviously, there's probably a few Northern Hemisphere teams that haven't haven't beaten the All Blacks lately. So I guess from their point of view, it'd be nice for their confidence, but I can't imagine it's weighing on the All Blacks too much. No, it doesn't seem that way at all. And you've got a huge personnel turnover as well from last year. Yeah, and the... the I mean, it keeps changing the All Blacks. You, look, you've got two wingers who aren't, weren't there last year and, and the midfield will be a bit different and and even the 10-15 combo wasn't wasn't what it was last year. So, yeah, as you say, big turnover and, uh, yeah, I, as I say, I don't, I don't think it'll be weighing on them. What's been your view on the Moonga 10 and Barrett at 15 axis? Yeah, I think they've been brilliant. Um, I've thought against South Africa um, after New Zealand, We've stood all that early pressure by uh, the spring box and the spring box forward pack. I thought that second 20 minutes of the uh, first half, they were brilliant. Their kicking game just broke up. The spring box rushed the fence and uh, they just took full advantage. And Moanga probably doesn't get enough credit for how attacking he is as a footballer and, and how dangerous he is. So, yeah, I think the 10 15 things worked a treat and uh, be interesting again tomorrow. Obviously, since the South African game, it probably, you know, the All Blacks probably haven't had too many big games, so tomorrow will be great to see them go again. Yeah, the 13-day turnaround is something that's going to be spoken about a bit. It has been spoken about a bit. Ireland playing last weekend. Are they at a disadvantage because of that? Oh, I don't think anyone's at an advantage or disadvantage. I think the All Blacks won't mind having that long a break, I don't think. Gets you completely fresh, and it means this training week you weren't having to worry about bruised bodies that you might have had after if they had played Italy. And, and I don't think Ireland would be too upset either, you know, they're just keeping their rhythm going and, and getting back into a bit of rhythm after, obviously, the, the Japanese game. Yeah, for sure. And I think uh, Steve Hansen was saying as well that it was like test-like conditions in training last Friday. Yeah, I mean, with GPSs and all that, these days you can monitor exactly how far people have run. So they'll have got the volume in and, and stuff like that and they can make up any sort of trainings they want to get the contact and that. So, yeah, I'd imagine that they'll be pretty well prepared. When you talk to anybody who's a rugby fan about the year 2011, if they're Irish, what they'll remember is uh, a shocking defeat to Wales, which we didn't expect coming. And uh, some of us actually forget that there was other things that happened uh, in that World Cup. Where were you at this stage in the 2011 World Cup quarterfinal week? Quarterfinal week? Uh, I've got to be honest, I wasn't taking too much notice. I, was, <laughs> I think I was already starting to fish, to be fair. I was, the pool, yeah, I, I, I didn't even see the great result that my fa- a lot of my family went to the um, Irish-Australia game which they still say is one of the, the great nights to be in uh, Eden <laughs> Park and uh, yeah, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see that game but uh, they say it was one of the great occasions and, uh, and that's, I wasn't taking, I'll be honest, I wasn't taking a whole lot of notice of the World Cup up until uh, when that phone rang. <laughs> like, so what happens actually if you just uh, go back a little bit before 2011, like how close were you to being on the plane? Was it a very, very tight call? How does that decision get made and, and how are you told about it? As far as missing out? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, you hope it was a tight call, but I, I don't know. So obviously had the, the years leading up to it was in there and then obviously had a bad run on the uh, interview tour, 2.10, and then uh, got rung up by uh, Ted at the end of Super Rugby in uh, 2.11 and sort of said, look, you won't be a part of um, us moving forward for the World Cup and, and have a good time. And I'd signed with Bath by that stage because I sort of knew the writing was on the wall so yeah just uh, have a good time in Bath and, and thanks so yeah it's, it was pretty much how it all went unfolded and was that it was that like at that moment that's my All Blacks career done 100% yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. There, was, there was no inkling that uh, I was even on the you know there was no oh if there's an injury you'll be <laughs> really straight out no? no 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 I got told there was I got told there was 
three ahead of me, obviously Dan, and then they had two more at a training camp um, prior to the World Cup, which didn't include me, obviously. And so at best I was four, but there was no confirmation. Right, because that that's what they always say is that, oh, just keep, stay on your toes, <laughs> you know, uh, st stay nearby and, and we'll give you a call, but no such thing. Oh, <laughs> I'd be lying if I said I was on my toes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so where were you exactly? I mean, the, the fishing story is well known, but for people who, who haven't heard it, t tell us what, what you get up to during the World Cup. You're clearly obviously not paying too much attention to the rugby. No, I was, uh, obviously I was, I was flying out to Bath and mm. six or seven weeks after the domestic season finished in New Zealand, so very much just uh, took it easy. Um, a bit of socialising, a bit of fishing and, uh, and just relaxing knowing that I was off the bar for what was supposed to be three or two years or whatever it was so um, yeah and then I guess the story of fishing here yeah, was when the uh, call finally came I was down the river fishing in, a, in an area where there was no phone reception and stuff like that so there was a bit of drama about trying to get a hold of me and all the rest of it but then ended up one of the boys rang me and said once I did get reception, then I had to ring uh, Sir Graham. So it was a bit, you know, a bit of an awkward phone call to have to make to the old boss to try and get back in there. But uh, yeah, probably more awkward for him. Like yeah, you, you didn't uh, drop him; he dropped yeah, you. Yeah, possibly. But ringing up somebody and asking, "Did you want? Did yeah, you need to speak okay, to me?" You yeah. know, it's yeah, it's an awkward it's an awkward phone call. Um, one thing before we talk about going back into the squad, like, was it a successful fishing trip? Did you catch anything good that day? Do you, what do you remember about it? Yeah, we got we got a fair bit of. It's in New Zealand. It's called white bait. It's a it's a delicacy that we have in our country. And uh, yeah, we had a good day. And and uh, Ted, Sir Graham said, if I uh, if I bring it enough into the team hotel, then he, he'll think about selecting me for the semi final <laughs> that weekend. So yeah, it's, it was a good day fishing. When do you realise that uh, you're going to play some part in a World Cup final? Uh, when Cruds, uh, sorry, Aaron Cruden was on the ground, mm. like up until then, obviously I was on the bench in the semi final and didn't play, so um, didn't have any preconceived ideas that I'd have much part to play in the final, you know, so it wasn't until Paul Cruds did his knee and that uh, rarely hit that uh, was going to be out there. So even after you know phoning Graham Henry up at that point, you're thinking to yourself, probably do a bit more fishing, probably relax a little bit while, while uh, in the All Black squad. Oh no, no. <laughs> Once that f phone call uh, came, it was very much a change in gears and yeah, lifestyle. Sure. To be fair, it, uh, when you get uh, dropped into the Auckland, uh, into the heritage in the Auckland hotel, there life life changed a fair bit. <laughs> fairly, the stress levels went up a little bit. Uh, what exactly? How, how tough was that for the system for somebody who hadn't exactly been in pre-season? Oh, it was good to get to the hotel, actually start living a bit cleaner and uh, eating some salads and what have you, to be fair. But, uh, no, nah, it, was, it was good. I mean, it was, although disappointed, you know, obviously heartbroken not to be at the start. It's what you always craved, but um, never thought, you know, even though you have, you know, these yeah. fantasy dreams that something might happen, uh, you never really expect it to yeah. get caught and let laid in the piece and, and be a part of it all. And, and obviously glad that it did because didn't want my all-black career, I guess, to be finished how it was going to be. Did you ever foresee what did happen in the final happening that you end up kicking the winning penalty to, to win the World Cup for the All Blacks? No, my great mate Richard Cahoo loves telling everyone that he does, but uh, <laughs> no, no, no idea. No, not at all. Why, what does he say? How did he predict it? Oh, he, he, he goes around telling everyone that wants to listen to him that uh, he knew it was going to happen and uh, he was saying it, you reckon, from months out. Never told me that, so, um, <laughs> you know, but uh, he just likes the limelight, I think, so, yeah. I, I have to wonder if that's, like, a huge kind of, if that was an advantage to you, actually, the fact that you were fishing a couple of weeks beforehand, the fact that your mind wasn't exactly on rugby, like, you hadn't been obsessing over this for months and months leading into it, which can often happen. People can crumble in a World Cup because it is the very epicentre of their universe. For you, it was very kind of quick in and then suddenly you're, you're in the zone, but you don't get bogged down perhaps by those pressures? No, you're probably right. There was, uh, there was definitely an aspect of that and, and not being a part of it. And, and I guess, you know, the, as I say, uh, the 10 or 11 months that sort of went through after the end of your tour from the previous year and, and the whole Super Rugby competition and then not making it, you know, I guess all that sort of weighed pretty heavily on me and uh, I guess when the opportunity came it was a case of well you got an opportunity that you never thought in your wildest dreams was ever going to show up so it was just a case of making sure you took it and uh and yeah making up for i guess a poor performance the year before what does what does graham henry say to you immediately after the full-time whistle do you remember uh do I, do I, <laughs> I don't, uh, no, I can't actually remember, actually. I've had many conversations with him since, but 
No, no, I can't remember what he said after the final, but like the best time of your life. Um, after the final, obviously a lot of jumping around like madmen at, at the final whistle, but the three or four days afterwards that we had as a team, just something you'll never forget. You know, you don't often get chances to spend time with that group of boys where there's no game to go to or there's no next week or, sure. or something like that. And it was just brilliant being able to travel the country and, and the parades and, and everything that we had. It was just, though, that, that's probably the thing that I'll never forget, never ever forget. Do you guys keep in touch often? Yep, I mean, uh, it's pretty easy to stay in touch with people these days. And, sure. and uh, when you're walking around Shinjuku at the moment, you know, you don't have to walk too far to see <laughs> some of your teammates uh, cashing in on something. So, uh, <laughs> I think there's a, there's a fair few up here at the moment, and uh, I think there's a few more coming in, so uh, it's, it's good. Well, let's hope they've only got like 48 hours left to cash in on that. Like, the, the one last thing just about, about 2011 is that it's not just winning a World Cup. It's also perhaps one of the most seismic World Cups for a nation, given the pressure on any all-black team, but also the pressure that comes on the all-blacks after 2007, after 2003, after 99, really. It's all, like, I don't want to use the word failure. Like, I mean, in an Irish context, that would have been successful World Cups. But from an all-blacks perspective, up until 07, it was failure. I mean, they were seen as, as teams who played well between the World Cups, and every four years, they bottled it. So that was kind of on your shoulders as well in, in 2011. Was that ever a factor in your thinking? Um, or as we talked about with my build-up, probably not. But yeah, sure. ab absolutely, like it was 24 years, like, and we hadn't won it since it was last in New Zealand. So uh, massive factor, you know. And, and we, and, you know, we couldn't hide from the fact that as a nation, we'd been probably the best rugby team on the planet, more or less, for all of that time. Yet hadn't won World Cups and. <laughs> and as you say, there's, there's some, some high drama events that sort of uh, led to those results. You know, obviously the French were, had their hands all over a couple of the big results that, you know, obviously 99 and 07 and, and then 03 was the Wallabies in, in Australia. And, you know, even go back when we were kids when the 95 World Cup, when it looked like with Jonah running rampant, that there was no way we couldn't win it, you know. Yeah. And, bit of food poisoning. Well, you know, you got to... <laughs> Make sure there's no South Africans around, but yeah, there's a bit of, <laughs> bit of food poisoning there. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and all that just added to it. So the 24 year thing was, it was, oh, it was a massive, it was a massive thing for the country. And uh, you know, the country had some massive disasters as far as sure. earthquake and that leading into it too. So to, for all to combine and, and bring some happiness to the to the country was pretty pretty special time in everyone's lives. What was the single biggest reason why the All Blacks did manage to get over the line in 2011, do you think? Was it just maybe just a lack of bizarre events that happened in previous World Cups? Are, do we sometimes look into too much the, the high performance shift that happened? Like, I know Graham Henry and Steve Hansen were both vital in terms of trying to create that culture shift. Was that noticeable for you? Um, oh, yeah. It was a, a well-run ship, you know, like sure. the experience involved in that coaching staff and, and what have you. But, um, and also, like, some of the experience of some of those leaders in the team, you know, like your, your Andrew Halls and Kevin Milamas, Woodcox and Thorne and Ali Williams, like you could rattle off that whole Ford pack. Richie was obviously, you know, running the whole show and, and you know, Conrad had already been to World Cups and, and stuff like that. So there was, there was massive experience all through it. So I think that had a fairly big part to play when things did start to go a little bit, you know, awry. We went around of a pump say so in that second half against the French that there was sort of enough experience enough cool heads there that we could get through it Is there that level of experience in this current All Blacks team because if you look through the back line there are a couple of people with a lot of caps but there's also a couple of people who we've mentioned already at the top here who don't have a lot of experience does that matter at all at this moment is their talent just so outrageous that the leadership qualities you can actually just rely on other areas of the team to kind of be, be like your Kieran Reid can be your totemic figure well, if, uh, absolutely. I think with Reed, Whitelock, Retallick, yeah. uh, Sam Kane's been in a World Cup final before. Dan Coles, you know, there's Moody, you know, there's not a bad pack. No, there's enough there yeah. that you know, like yes, I know what you're saying about the back line, but as, as you also touched on the the talent in that back line, and, and when you compare it to the other teams that they're playing, um, I don't think an experience in the backs will be an issue. You still got Bodie Barrett out the back who's I don't know what he's up to now, but he's played a truckload of footy, World Cup final, you know, he's done it all too. So, um, no, I think Aaron Smith, you know, there's, there's plenty in the back division that, you know, that can make up for any perceived inexperience, you know. So, no, and the young guys, Bridge and Severus, they've played for Crusaders, they've won 
Super Ford, whatever it's called now, Super 18 or <laughs> Finals, you know. So there's no there's no shortage of uh, experience when it really counts. Is there any concern from a New Zealand perspective that an upset might be on the cards tomorrow? New Zealand or just me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean... Your, your perspective, in, in uh, your view. I mean, I mean from, a, from a respect point of view from Ireland, it's massive, you know. I think, I think everyone's got massive respect for Joe Smith and in what you know he is a coaching you know he's a bit of a genius so who knows what he could come out with you know i know there's been a bit of talk about that in the media and as you say they've beaten they've beaten the all blacks recently so oh i don't think anyone's taking it for granted we're feeling the rain as yeah. we speak you know and the talk is it's going to come down tomorrow so you know there's there's no doubt that you know all all these quarterfinals are, are great matchups but the way they're going at the moment and and how the all blacks are playing then yeah i mean as a new zealander i'm fairly confident that you know they'll they'll get through this one but you know it's who knows now is it's knockout stuff yeah for sure so all blacks by how many uh 13 13, 13. Well, i thought you were going to go for bigger there for, <laughs> <laughs> listen Stephen donald it's been great catching up with you thanks a million for your time and standing out in the the drizzle here but you're well used to it as a, as a new zealander yeah, of course <laughs>